Welcome to the Travel Tips and Trips podcast, where I explore the world one destination at a time. Today, I am actually going to be keeping things a bit more casual as I come to you live from my bedroom, where I'm enjoying a semi-relaxing weekend of wellness and binge-watching Naked and Alone on Discovery+. Plus. I will definitely be talking about travel in this episode as well, but with a few episodes out of the way now, I also just wanted to take a moment to slow things down and chat a little so that anyone who isn't already familiar with me from my other social media platforms can get to know me or so that you can just get to know me even better. So if you're interested in a more relaxed, easy listen today, then definitely stick around and let's jump right into it. So before I talk travel and travel plans, I have got to share with you this story of something that happened to me recently in the neighborhood where I live. This happened last week at the height of the wildfire smoke invading our area as well. So just to set the scene, there was a very eerie vibe that probably played a little bit into this, but I'll get into that a little bit later. So last week, my little sister came out to Alberta, where I live, uh, to visit me for really the first time that she had ever been out this way in the summertime. We had plans to go do a little bit of adventuring for sure, especially with the weather being so nice, but the wildfires kicked up right around that time, and so we were pretty much just hanging out here at home, glass of wine here or there, chatting, all of that fun stuff, just catching up. And because she had never been to my house in the summertime, she didn't really like know a lot about the lay of the land. To give you a bit of an idea, my house is built sort of backing on to a bit of a path system, like a bike path system. And then on the other side of that path, there's just like trees, shrubbery, all of that type of stuff. And then beyond that, there's just nothingness. So we were sitting in my living room and just like having a glass of wine, chatting. And my sister says to me, can people see in your back windows? And I was like, well, you know, when it's dark out and the lights are on inside, yeah, probably. But like, no, not really. And so she then proceeds to say, oh, okay, well, this man just came walking out of the bushes behind your house. And it honestly looked like he was looking directly at me, like making eye contact with me through the window. And at this point, I was thinking, okay, well, he couldn't have come out of the trees because there would be nowhere for him to come from. He was probably just on the paved path. Um, But she was like, no, he definitely came out of the trees. Is there like more paths back there to walk on? Which there absolutely is not. So I go to the window. I'm kind of watching him cautiously from the window in our living room. And he's kind of walking up and down the back path. He goes towards my neighbor's house. He walks by our house. He sort of goes a little bit further um, in the opposite direction. He goes back into the bushes. He comes back out. And all of the while, he's like looking around. Really, the way that my sister described it, and I completely agree, was like, it was as if he had time traveled and just sort of arrived in this like new location. Didn't know where he was. Didn't know what year it was. That was kind of the vibe that he was giving. Like he was looking around for something, but He was also walking through tall grass and things like that, and he wasn't looking down. So it was like he was looking for something, but he wasn't looking for something. It was all very odd. So anyway, being the cautious neighbor that I am, I sent a text to my neighbor on the right just to be like, hey, just so you know, there's this guy walking around back behind our houses. He looks a little bit suspicious, you know, the smoky vibe. It was a little bit later at night, like it was about 830. Um, And he just kind of seems a little disoriented. So just kind of keep your eye out. But that was the last that we saw of him that night. And, you know, I just chalked it up to weird vibes. That's fine. So then the next day, and bear with me here because this is all relevant. The next day, I come downstairs mid-afternoon from putting my daughter to sleep. And I look out the window and he's standing there, this same guy again, different clothes. He's obviously changed. But he's standing there again, directly behind my house, looking all over the place, like frantically. And then like walking into the like tree area, coming back out, walking back and forth, all very bizarre. And my husband comes downstairs and I'm like, that's him. That's the same guy. Like, does he look suspicious to you? Are we just kind of making this up in our head? And my husband agreed. 
that he absolutely looked suspicious and that he was going to go out and confront this fella and just basically say like, hey, you know, you look a little suspicious. What exactly are you up to directly behind our house? Like, yes, it's a public path, but he was just weird vibes all around. So he goes out and we're like watching like children in a window like waiting to see this altercation and just like in case anything goes awry. I was a little bit nervous about it. Honestly, I'm not a very confrontational person at all. Um, But my husband is very calm. He has a very calm nature. So I wasn't too worried. But he gets out to the back and then he just walks by the guy and comes back into the house. And I'm like, what happened? Like, why didn't you confront him? Turns out this man was walking his cat off leash in the woods behind our house so when he was looking around frantically really what he was doing was just like following the sound of the cat jumping in the grass but we can't see the cat because it's so small and the long grass is long so i've been telling this story to honestly anybody who will listen at this point i think it's probably the oddest outcome and the most unexpected outcome to a story like that And the fact that it happened during the peak of the wildfire smoke and just like the very eerie vibe totally added to the situation. So like if you can envision it, it was all very eerie and ominous to see this disoriented man emerging from the forest behind my house. And if you aren't familiar with Canadian news at the moment, um, I guess this would be a good time to mention that we're on fire. It feels like almost everywhere. So while yes, that is interrupting our travel plans, um, I do also want to acknowledge before I continue talking about anything related to the wildfires that like 20,000 people have been evacuated from their homes so far this season, with many of those people losing their homes completely, homes lost to wildfires across the country as well. So going on vacation or not, or being able to road trip through Alberta this spring with my sister is certainly not the most important thing in the grand scheme of things. I fully acknowledge that. I am here talking about, you know, not being able to adventure with my sister um, and just like the state of travel and tourism and things like that now um, that I'm going to jump into. But I definitely don't want anyone to think that this is like me complaining about having to stay home or viewing the current situation as like a burden or an inconvenience. This is so much bigger than travel plans and tourism and bigger than me for sure. But the reality of the situation is that people travel in wildfire season every single year. And it's been brought to my attention that they don't always know it or understand the risks at all. So I wanted to talk about that a little bit today also. I think I'm going to do that now. Um, So traveling during wildfire season is something that people do year after year, there's a wildfire season every single year. And I think a lot of people forget that in the process of making travel plans and just overall being excited for warm weather after the longer winters that we experience here, especially in Alberta, where I'm currently living. So I do want to take a moment to talk about travel planning in the wildfire season, just so that you guys can walk away from today's casual chat with some helpful travel tips and inspiration for traveling during extreme weather. When it comes to travel planning in wildfire seasons specifically, which is basically March through October here in Alberta, it really is so important to just keep these few things in mind and to stay flexible and informed as well. And staying informed, especially if you are coming from out of country or out of province, is probably first and foremost what you need to be doing Even if you're just checking in on social media, honestly, TikTok seems like it has the most up-to-date information on the wildfires these days, um, which sounds ridiculous. Now, that is as long as you do take the time to fact check. But TikTok has been fantastic for us throughout this wildfire season. And then I will also um, leave some links or resources and things like that where you can check um, in the description for this episode. And then prior to your departure, you're also going to want to be checking for any travel advisories that are new, evacuation orders that have just popped up, or road closures that might actually affect your planned routes as well. Road closures especially 
whether they're wildfire related or not, are so common at West, it feels like. And in a lot of cases, exploring in the Rockies, for example, there may only be one or two routes to any specific destination. So keeping on top of road closures for sure is always advised, honestly. We have run into some really brutal road closure situations in both Alberta and BC just by being unprepared and overconfident, honestly, traveling in good weather as locals. And after hours and hours in traffic, you really start to regret not doing something as easy or simple as checking your route for closures on Google Maps before you leave for the day. And in saying that, it's also important to be flexible in your plans and maybe have a backup plan in mind if you're camping, for example, and can easily change locations. This actually reminds me of a time that I was traveling through the Rockies with Canadream RVs for a brand deal. It was August, so beautiful weather, and we needed to get out and take some photos of the camper van that we were traveling in. So we booked a beautiful campsite on the lake, in the mountains, and out of nowhere, we got this huge snowstorm in the middle of August. So obviously we didn't expect that, but because we had already had some alternate options in mind just in case of road closures or other extreme weather or wildfires, um, we were able to pack up, head south, and change locations to get away from the snow and enjoy the warm weather for the rest of our week relatively stress-free. Obviously, there was still some stress involved, but not nearly as much as if we just didn't see it coming and had absolutely nothing else planned. And we live in Alberta, we're familiar with Alberta and the mountains, but I can't even imagine how much more amplified that would be if we were coming in and traveling from out of province or out of country. So always kind of keeping that in mind, something that I recommend. And then there's the more obvious things like travel insurance and packing appropriately. Actually, the fact that we had a ton of N95 masks hanging around recently actually served us really well in the smoky conditions um, from the wildfires. And then just being aware of fire bans or restrictions. And please, for the love of all that is not on fire, adhere to those restrictions. You may feel like a tiny fire couldn't possibly cause that much of a problem, but we have seen entire forests up in flames from a cigarette butt. So please, if there's a fire ban, no fires, please. And actually, over the long weekend, I know there were a lot of people who had plans to either come in from out of province or people from the city that I live in, in Edmonton, who were planning to head out to the mountains, explore in the provincial parks that were not yet affected by wildfires. And a lot of those provincial parks ended up just closing their gates and not allowing people to come camp at all, presumably at least in part because there are so many instances of campers coming out and just starting a small fire or throwing a cigarette butt on the ground, as I've mentioned a couple of times now. But I don't think it's always taken as seriously as it should be, even when there are smoky skies and all of those things. So it is an important thing to take notice of. Believe me, I would have loved to have gone exploring over the long weekend. And a couple of the parks that I had wanted to visit even just for the day were part of those closures. And yeah, we are all affected. And you know, yes, we had plans and then those plans get canceled. But we do also need to keep in mind the bigger picture. And wildfires just they're not good for anyone, including wildlife. And I know my husband, for example, because he works a lot further north in the province than I do. And they've been seeing a lot more bears and moose and wildlife out on the roads to and from work lately because of the wildfires and animals fleeing wildfires and getting displaced. I remember not this year particularly, but a couple of years ago when there was a wildfire fairly close to where we were living in the more northern end of the city. Um, we were seeing like moose and deer and things coming into the neighborhood where we lived because we lived in like a suburb kind of on the outskirts of town, but not in 
amongst wildlife by any means. Like, we weren't close to big forests or, like, wildlife spaces. And a lot of animals were, like, coming into the city. It was a whole thing. I haven't seen a lot of that this year yet. My only wildlife encounters so far in 2023 have been a herd of ducks, school of ducks. What are, what's, what's a class of ducks? A bunch of ducks, a family of ducks um, around my backyard and uh, the cat man. But all of that to say, extreme weather is often par for the course when it comes to traveling. And not only when you're traveling in Canada, but really if you're traveling anywhere. Right now, it is wildfire season in Alberta, but I'm specifically thinking about, I mean, we travel in shoulder season and low season in Southeast Asia all the time, typhoon season in the Philippines. Actually, on my first trip to the Philippines, I was traveling in the Philippines for 40 days, and we were somewhere in the Caramon Islands, I believe, um, if you're familiar with the Philippines and that area. And we were staying in these little huts on uh, on the beach, and there was a big storm coming in. And at that point in my travel adventure journey, I had really chosen to travel at that time of year because it was cheaper. That really was the driving force. Now, it was cheaper because it was typhoon, monsoon season, but that wasn't something that necessarily crossed my mind at the time wasn't front of mind. I was just, I wanted a big fun adventure. I was not that long out of university. So yeah, I just wanted to like get out there, enjoy the world. So that said, staying in these huts on the beach, storm is coming in. I'm thinking, okay, like, you know, it's going to be a fairly big storm. They recommended that we just sort of like hatch, hatch? No, lock our like windows our wooden board windows that have the little like wooden latch on them. I hope that makes any sense. I'm trying to paint a picture for you here. But either way, they had told us, you know, it's going to be a pretty big storm. So I was traveling actually at the time with a travel partner um, and he had another friend on the trip. And so normally we would have been sharing a room, but that night he decided he was going to crash with his other buddy. So I was in our little um like beach cabana by myself and he came back at one point to get some clothes for the morning and I was like this storm like I'm a little bit nervous it seems like it's getting pretty big like are you do you think I should be cautious nervous like what's up he basically said don't worry about it like the locals just said it's gonna be a big storm we go through big storms all the time in Canada (laughs) Um, so, you know, just keep your windows closed and, you know, chill out. Basically don't, you know, don't overreact. And so me being the people pleaser that I am was like, okay, don't overreact. Don't be that person who like gets overly scared, um, when they don't need to be. So the night rolled on, this storm was absolutely wild. I was like hiding underneath my, um, like my bunk blankets, just like trying not to look. I could hear like tree branches and leaves and coconuts and things like that hitting the roof and the side of our cabana, things like that. So proud of myself, made it through the night, woke up in the morning. And when I tell you that half of our roof had been pulled clear off of our bungalow, I walked out to the owner of the hostel like just standing, staring at my bungalow. She was like, are you okay? And I was like, I didn't want to overreact. (laughs) Everybody seemed to get a good laugh about it, but that's definitely one like extreme weather situation that comes to mind for me when I think about people coming to Canada, for example, who don't necessarily know what to expect, you know? And so they think, okay, you know, a big storm and they liken it to a big storm where they're from or a snowstorm and they liken it to what they've seen on TV, but you don't always really know. And what feels normal to the local of one area is definitely not going to feel normal to someone who is coming in and traveling. I want to say that that's probably the most extreme weather that I've directly experienced while traveling, but it's also possible that I'm 
forgetting some things too after traveling for so many years and going to so many different destinations. Caramoan Islands, though, fun fact, was also a spot that we visited where they had been filming. I can't remember. They either had just finished filming or they were in the process of filming for Survivor in the Philippines. And we went out on this big boat trip um, in like long tail boats. There was probably 25 of us at that point, all of us traveling together. And so we went out on this like island hopping day trip where we were going from beach to beach and we pulled up on this beach and there were like competition style platforms for Survivor all set up along the beach, like flags on them. And there was nobody to be seen. Like there was no like actual quote unquote survivors or cameramen or crew or anything like that. But we were there. Um, and a few members of our little group like swam out to the challenge podium things and were jumping off and doing all these things. We were probably out there for like 25 minutes or so before someone did come on a boat and be like, hey, for like liability purposes, you can't be on there. But that was just a fun little memory that I was reminded of um, about the Caramon Islands. And then when we were back at our hostel in the little town where we were staying, like after all of the island hopping, people kept asking us if we were like part of the survivor crew, like camera crew and things like that, because I think because we were like a bigger group of people uh, in that area. And it wasn't like a super commonly visited location at the time, I don't think. I'm pretty sure Caramoan is a little bit more um, of a popular tourist spot now, maybe. Although I'm, I honestly, I'm not even sure if that's true because, you know, Philippines, I am a travel planner for Southeast Asia, but I don't plan currently, um, nor have I ever planned travel in the Philippines. That could be a future thing, but it has been quite some time since I've been. So I think that it's been more popularized, but that's just me casually chatting. So if you plan on bringing that fact to a friend, uh, maybe do a little fact check on that one. No other extreme weather though on that Philippines trip. I know I experienced quite a few like earthquakes traveling through South America. I traveled through South America for six months back in 2014, I want to say. There was um, earthquakes. There was a volcano eruption, I believe. Um, there were a couple of wildfires there as well, uh, just like north of Santiago at the time, but we weren't traveling in that area during the wildfires. We had left um, just before that all happened. So now that I I'm like listing it out. It does seem like a lot of extreme weather that I've experienced, but certainly nothing any more devastating than like having the roof torn off my beach bungalow. But the earthquake that we experienced in Chile that does stand out for me was actually more memorable for me, not because of its size or like any damage that it did, but more so because it was really just one of the first larger earthquakes that I had experienced in my travels at all. And Myself and my partner, we were staying in essentially like a mud hut at that time. Maybe, well, maybe that's a little bit extreme. There was definitely a floor, but it wasn't like a super stable accommodation by any means. And when the earthquake hit in the middle of the night, it was about 2, 2.30 in the morning, it was dark and it was more of like a rolling feeling than it was a shaking feeling. And so... When we got up in the morning, we were talking about it like all morning because it was just such like a unique new feeling for us. But it was so common for the people who actually lived there that they weren't bothered by it at all, which makes sense. And also, sorry, now I feel like I'm going off on 100 tangents, but this also reminds me um, when I volunteered in Thailand, the kids that I volunteered with would often talk about how terrified they were of ice rain or like hail in Canada when we talked about them traveling to Canada or if they wanted to go to Canada. For them, the thought of ice shards falling from the sky, and yeah, when you put it like that, and you've never experienced hail before, it probably is just as scary to think about as it is for us to think about typhoons and earthquakes and volcano eruptions in other countries. But summer is here now. No hail, just wildfires. And I am really hoping 
that we can keep things under control, not just here, but across Canada now as well with so many more fires breaking out. I think the fire bans probably are helping, but definitely don't prevent fires 100% with people throwing cigarette butts out their windows or even just like lightning strikes lighting things up again. So I'll be staying prepared for evacuation over here, but hoping for the best. And if you are in Canada and in a wildfire zone, I'll be hoping all the good things for you as well. My younger sister has now gone back to uh, the East Coast. And when she was out here visiting in Alberta, she was talking about how it was so different for her to be experiencing the smoke and the fear of wildfires. And we had gotten some um, potential evacuation alerts for the areas just um, west of us. So we weren't being evacuated here, but we were sort of told to stay on alert and put together a evacuation to-go box and things like that with all of like paperwork that we needed. And I was showing that to my sister when she arrived, basically just saying like, you know, we're not really in any danger and it's unlikely that we will be, but you know, with everything that's been going on, this is how we're prepared. And if anything was to happen, so on and so forth. And she was talking about how in the East Coast, they don't generally have to worry about any of that. Um, wildfires are not a common thing out there the way that they are out here. And um, so, yeah, so now she's gone home to the East Coast. And in this crazy wildfire season that we're having in Canada, where it just seems like anything goes, all of a sudden they have two or more. Um, fairly large wildfires out in the area where they live. And I've heard a lot of people talking, especially in Alberta or Albertans, talking about how small the wildfires in other provinces like Nova Scotia on the East Coast are compared to what we have here in Alberta. But we also have so much more land um, and forest and things like that to burn. So for us, a lot of our fires are like grass fires and forest fires. And yes, people are evacuating. And of course, there have been people who've lost their homes and things, and that's devastating. But in Nova Scotia, I think it is a lot more like communities that are being affected and people's houses burning down. And when they think about those fires spreading, there's not very far that they can spread before they're running into other communities or houses and things like that. So all that to say, while it does feel like wildfires are kind of par for the course um, in wildfire season. It also has been a bit of an excessive uh, different year this year and spring this year. So I'm hoping, fingers crossed, that uh, things get more under control and not more out of control. And from a more selfish travel perspective, that way I can also take you guys um, exploring, do some on-location things like that. Again, not to take away from the severity of the situation, but travel is what we do here and what we talk about here. And um, also what I share on YouTube, which is where all of this sort of came from. So it is very much my intention to get back to doing some travel and sharing some more experiences with you, um, as, you know, wildfires aside. So I think with all of that said, um, I'm going to leave this episode here. So thank you so much for joining me on my walk down memory lane. If you couldn't tell, there's nothing that I love talking about more than travel. Don't forget to tune in next time for more exciting travel tips and destinations. And until I catch up with you then, stay great, travel safe, and I'll see you back here for the next episode of the Travel Tips and Trips podcast.